Next, I want to bring up uh, Megan Schott. I got that right? Perfect. Um, uh, sadly, we all know how stressful this uh, pandemic has been. There's been increased awareness of um, mental health concerns and suicide risks among uh, our patients even before the pandemic, but the pandemic has only uh, escalated the stresses and the challenges. And um, so uh, Dr. Schott's gonna speak to us about uh, suicidal ideation in the primary care practice setting. Thanks. So we're, we are touching a hard topic first thing in the morning, but it's this happens any time of day. So I think it's, it doesn't matter what time, if it's in the morning or in the evening. So it's okay to start um, heavy right from the beginning. But like they said, I'm Megan Schott. I'm the, actually the medical director of, um, of Psychiatric Emergency Services at Children's National. And this is what I deal with every single day. Um, probably unlike most of you, but maybe maybe we should be dealing with it every single day. I have no, um, no disclosures to and this is my bio if you actually want to read all about me and what I do, but I'm involved in quite a bit, quite a bit of things and um, on national committees and a lot of things like that. And one of my other hats that I do a lot of things is, is in the opioid community as well. Um, so what is suicide? I think we need to actually make sure we actually all have the same common language of what we're dealing with when we're talking about this, because um, what it means to me and to you might be very vastly different. So suicide is, is defined as death caused by self-directed injurious behavior with the intent to die because of this behavior. A suicide attempt is a non-fatal self-directed potential injurious behavior with the intent to die as a result of behavior. And it may not even result in injury. So sometimes we think like, oh, it's not really a suicide attempt, but it's really all because like they only took two multivitamins and we know that's not gonna kill them. But if the intent is there, it's actually still an attempt. And then suicidal ideation refers to thinking about considering or planning suicide. So these are all very basic um, ideas, but not necessarily Sometimes we get them a little bit confused. And another big thing that we might also get confused is cutting. Um, this happens all the time in, in the world, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's suicide. Um, oftentimes kids cut for a wide variety of reasons and usually the least one is suicide. It's usually because they're trying to, um, to gain some type of control over their depressive symptoms that they're experiencing. And so we assume that this is always suicide. It can get us into a lot of trouble. So kind of like what I just said is cutting a suicide attempt and you don't know until you ask. Um, and so it's important to ask about this because you don't, you have no idea what you're gonna get. Um, but one in every 200 girls between 13 and 19 cut themselves regularly. So if we have, that would be a lot of people attempting suicide on a regular basis if that was happening. Um, and boys account really for less than 10% of self-harm. Um, and, but we see even in the child literature that the suicide rates are higher for boys um, and actually attempt that actually not completing suicide and not just attempting it. Um, it's a little bit different, um, different females where they're actually attempting but not completing. But it's, it's really common, very prevalent. And if you're not asking, you're not looking and you're not observing it, you're not going to know. And a lot of times these are even getting hidden by their family and friends because they're always wearing long sleeve shirts. Maybe they're cutting on their legs and not on their arms or the cutting cut marks are so faint. Um, another thing that I've really learned from patients is they'll, they can use anything and everything to, to cut. So even if you have people removing things from their home, their um, families are actually finding, our kids are finding that like the razors in um, pencil sharpeners that are used in schools are a big common thing that people are using. Um, so I always remind parents to like take that out. Um, even when they're on our unit, sometimes people are using low, uh, the yogurt lids because they're creating sharp things because they really just get some really self similar self stimulatory thing out of the pain of causing pain on themselves. But suicide is a leading, leading cause of death in the United States. Um, this, and, um, and we know this and it's been dating back for several years. Um, it's the second leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 10 and 34 and the fourth leading cause between ages 35 to 54. Um, and, and there were more than twice as many suicides in the United States as there were homicides. And we think about like gun violence, and all those things being a hot topic, but we actually, like, we need to actually think about like gun control and everything else for suicides, even more than homicides, which or murders or other type of things we're seeing, like with the mass shootings that we're seeing right now. So this is really big common problem. And this is actually showing this, the 2016 CDC data of where it really falls. And a lot of the unintentional injuries, we actually wonder if they actually are suicide attempts that are just getting mislabeled. So this number could actually be much higher 
higher. This is just what we actually can, can attribute to suicides. Um, and, and it's really prevalent in our 10 to, in the 10 to 24 year old community, which is a large part of what we're treating. And I've seen kids actually complete suicide younger than 10. And that's going to be a huge problem. So we think, oh, the cutoff is 10, the cutoff is 12, the cutoff is this. And whenever we actually have a cutoff, that actually becomes a problem because we'll start seeing suicides actually happening um, even younger ages. And we're not even addressing it because we're afraid to. We don't, we don't think, oh, this kid will have the capacity to do this, but it's being talked about in every aspect of their lives. And so we actually need to make sure we are addressing it. This is actually the YRBSS um, national data from 2019. They haven't pulled, pulled the 2021 data out where you can actually look at it, but you can see the trends of, of, what, of what they've asked from suicidal ideation. So, um, so the first part is seriously considered attempting suicide. And nationally, that data is, is about almost 20%, 18.8%. And really, there hasn't been a, a huge change in this um, since 20, um, since, I mean, it goes back to 91, but it, it hasn't really been changed since 2007. Um, but 20% are, are saying yes on this national data base of high school students. Um, and then making a plan, we're seeing about 15 to 16% making a plan. And this has actually increased from 2009 to 2019. So we're seeing this as like, they might be still having the same amount of thoughts of wanting to die, but they're actually starting to plan it a little bit more than they used to in the past. Um, and about 10% or 8.9% really is actually has attempted suicide and about 2.5% have actually required medical attention for it. And it's amazing how many kids come into me and they, when I see them in the emergency department, because they finally somehow got caught, I guess is what I would say from their suicide attempt or suicidal ideation. And they're telling me, oh, I attempted and I overdosed like uh, three three times before and no one even knows. And no one, I never sought medical attention or my parents didn't care. They didn't send me to the ER. They just thought it'd be fine to take care of. So this is just people actually seeking medical attention. So the actual number that probably should be seeking medical attention is significantly higher. So that's the national, um, the national trends, but what's come happening in District of Columbia? And I, I'm highlighting this one because that's really where I work and that's majority of what I see, but we see kind of similar trends in Maryland and Virginia. Um, but it's interesting because we're seeing it's being kind of remained stable for uh, Maryland and, and Virginia um, and, and nationally. But in DC, we actually see the suicide rates being significantly higher. Um, these little dots that you can't actually see what they mean, but um, the feeling sad or hopeless is actually consistent with the national data trends that are happening. So we're still having the same amount of people actually feeling sad and feeling depressed um, here nationally. But when we actually look at actually attempting, we see a, an increase in a number of people of attempting. It's, it's fairly similar, but slightly, it's slightly higher with 19.2%. And then making a plan, it's 3% it's higher at 17.9. Actually attempting, we're almost doubled what the national average is, like we're, we're hitting about 15% are actually attempting. So 15% of our youth in DC are attempting suicide. In the, and this is just in the last 12 months. Um, and then actually needing uh, medical attention, it's also over double what, what it is in DC as well with 5.6%. And this is not even including the pandemic data. This is from 2019. Um, so it's a huge problem. And we already know that it actually was a problem even before this. So, um, to really address some of the COVID-19 experiences that happened, they did also, um, the CDC also did pull out the Adolescent Behaviors and Experience Survey. Um, this is actually kind of get an idea of what's happening because of COVID-19. And the, the survey is not nearly as vast as the YRBS, BRSS, and it's actually a little bit harder to actually find um, DC regional data, but this is giving us an idea of what's happening in the pandemic. So we're seeing, um, about 44% saying they felt hopeless in the last 12 months. So significantly higher. Um, they 20% considered suicide. 15 thought they were going to make a plan. 9% actually attempted. So that's actually um, like a little bit, a little bit consistent with what it was before. Um, a little bit lower actually had that actually attempted it by poisoning. And, um, and about 30% said that their mental health wasn't very good in the last 12 months. So this is actually showing us that the trends have like slightly increased, but mainly stayed the same. Um, but it's been, an, it's still a huge problem. And so like, these are something that the, ki the kids are really experiencing and have seen a, a huge difference within the pandemic as well. And when you look at it based off gender, um, we see that overall females are experiencing a little bit worsening things. And kind of like what I said before, um, males are actually taking a little bit more initiative um, in, in doing and actually completing, but not necessarily attempting. It's almost double for females compared to males for actually attempting. Um, 
but it's, it, it's something we need to address and it's and it's a fairly problem based off race um, we actually see um, Hispanic and African American communities um, actually attempting and not actually getting services nearly as much and so we need to actually make sure we're really addressing it not just with our our white counter folks but like everyone that's involved because they're not getting the services that they need as well and even more um, prevalent is is we see a significantly increase more in the LGBTQ population um, we, we already know that nationally that this um, having L being LGBTQ um, means you're gonna have more likely in your lifetime to commit suicide and do this, but we're actually seeing um, a significantly increase have actually said that they've attempted suicide. 13.6% have actually said they have attempted suicide in the, in, in the, um, the past year. Um, so it's, it's, this is double the, the rate. So if you're actually having, if you're, if you're seeing this population, you really need to make sure to ask this. So, the, so here are just some warning signs of what to look for. Um, and if so, it, and it, this is not necessarily just because you see the warning signs, I mean, they have suicidal ideation and vice versa. Even if you don't see the warning signs, doesn't mean they're not actually having these symptoms. Um, but if they start talking about it, if they're withdrawing from family, if their grades have fallen, if they're getting into drugs and alcohol more, um, sudden just changes in mood, this is something we need to look into. Like changes in mood is, I think it's one of the most prevalent things that I really see people think, oh, they're bipolar, that's why they have change in mood. Usually no, it's sad and they're coming off as being angry and irritable. And so if we're seeing this kind of change, let's ask about depression symptoms. So what do we do about it? So the Joint Commission in 2019, I know a lot of you guys are not part, are not hospital based things, but this is giving us an idea of where, what uh, what we want people to actually use. They actually mandated suicide screens for all, all people coming in for behavioral health concerns using a validated tool. Um, they recommended um, a year later to be 12 and up, but when I was working in Denver, um, when they actually started doing it at 12 and up, the, the day after, or the week after they actually implemented 12 and up, three people um, killed themselves and actually were dead, not just like attempted, um, that were between 10 and 12. So, so they got completely missed on the screen and it was like devastating news for the schools there. And they're like, okay, so what age do we need to do? Um, and so it's really important to know like 12 and up is like a guideline, but it's not necessarily going to capture everyone that's being involved and in actually having issues. And the other thing is, is that this, um, that the use of evidence-based suicide thing can actually, um, who, Sorry, the assessment needs, you also, in addition to doing the screen, you also need to do an assessment. I think that's part of the thing. So what do we do once we get the screen? And that can be a huge problem. And so making sure we actually ask more about it because just because you're having suicidal ideation doesn't mean you're actually planning and all these other various things that are kind of going on along with it. And so being able to manage it in a way that's appropriate is helpful. So these are the ones the Joint Commission actually recommends for screeners that they put on their, on their website. And I'm gonna go through all of them a little bit better because it's important for pediatricians to, to be able to do screens um, because when we're looking at data, um, it takes, um, when, it, when someone comes in with behavioral health concerns to the pediatric clinic, the, the appointment is going to be 2.5 times longer. And so screens can actually, especially if you're doing them net, like right from the very beginning, can actually help decrease the amount of time that you actually are, are seeing and, and serving your patient. So if you just do it for every single person right at the very beginning before they, it can actually save you a lot of time and possibly money where you actually can actually address the concerns that are actually happening because you already have that and you can actually work on part of the assessment. So when you're choosing a, um, a suicide screen, it, um, psychometricians, I think that's how you say it, but people who actually learn how to act, um, who are the smart people doing the math behind this, say that the ideal screener should be between four to seven questions. Um, and single item measures of contract, including suicide, should be avoided on only in rare situations. So that's like, even though the PHQ-9 is one of the things that are in there, you're not really getting a full idea of what's really happening. Um, and then the American College, College of Emergency Physicians report that suicide screening is positive for 42%, but only make up 1.5% of true positives. Now this is granted for the adult population, but it's, that it's really trying to show that you actually can't just rely completely on the screen. So this is the ED safe secondary screen. I'm not gonna spend that much time because you guys are pediatrician, you're not in the ED, so we don't really need to utilize this. Um, the PHQ-9 is something that's really being really prevalent and actually utilized in um, a lot of outpatient care settings, and it's great to, for measuring depression. Um, it's nine questions, and it, and it helps to really monitoring it. And, and question nine is just like screens for the presence and duration of suicide, and it's really asking the last um, in the last two weeks. Um, 
it's just a single question answer. So you're not actually getting a lot of dat data from it and they scream positive and so what do you do? So in, in general, this item nine has a, for suicide, it's, has a sensitivity of 80%, a specificity of 70%. Um, but it's not really giving us capturing a lot of the data. So this is really helpful, but we probably need to consider something a little bit more advanced if you actually want to figure out what's really happening with you with your children. Um, and then the other, another one that's geared for 12 and up is the, the patient safety screen or the PSS3. Um, it was actually developed in the emergency department, but it's been proven to be able to use in outpatient settings as well. And it's meant for universal screenings and not just for people coming in for behavioral health complaints. A little bit higher sensitivity, a little bit lower specificity. So 95%, but specificity is 33, 35%. Um, one of the ones they actually was created just for adolescents was the tool of, for assessment of suicide risk. It was developed in um, Great Britain and, and it's used between the ages of 13 and 18. And it actually has a second section addressing the, with a case ad, which is a depression in inventory. So you can actually kind of like the PHQ-9 can actually get some other symptoms that are happening. It's a semi-structured interview. It supposedly can take about three to five minutes to actually complete. Um, but when I actually reached out to the developers of this, they actually told me there's no psychometric properties for this instrument because in order to truly address suicidal ideation, you need to be doing assessment. And he's absolutely right when he said that. And he actually thought it was when I was talking about the Joint Commission that like I um, that the, the Joint Commission mandating this to actually and using psychometric properties and actually being able to only relying on screens was kind of a fallacy and you know, not getting us what we really need. But it actually does give us quite a bit of data and a lot of other um, entities use this um, use the screener to actually validate their screen and screen. So it's interesting in itself. Another one is the suicide behavioral questionnaire revised version. The revised version is, is what makes it between 13 and 18 percent. It's a four question self item report um, and sensitivity and specificity are actually pretty good with 93 percent and 95, I mean, 93 and 95 percent. Um, one of the big ones that a lot of people are using are the ASQ or the Ask Suicide Screening Questions. This was actually developed um, in partnership with NH NIMH and Children's National, although at Children's National we're not fully using this, but this is a four item questions, four item suicide screening tool. It um, has a pretty high sensitivity rate of 96% and specificity of, of 87% and return to the ED specificity of 43%. So I think that's actually giving us a, a pretty good indication of what's happening. And it and there's actually a partnered with it on the NIMH website has an has the next section of how to actually do the assessment with it and not just utilizing it for that. And it's actually geared for primary care settings. Um, it can be used for almost all ages and it's pretty easy to, to actually ask it. Um, and if you're doing research, this is what one a lot of the NIMH people actually want you to use. And the one that we're using here at Children's National is the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. It's been developed for ages seven, six and up. Um, psychometric data is interesting because of the, even though they got approved for that, that data, they actually didn't originally do it for, for in children. And so it kind of got grandfathered into it. So the specificity and, specificity and sensitivity rates are actually for the adult population. Um, but the, the value in this is you can ask um, just the first two questions, and then if they don't scream positive, you don't have to, you don't actually have to ask the rest of the questions, and it can actually risk stratify it for you, so low, medium, high, um, based on what they're actually getting. Now, not, that, that's not actually indicating, like, what you should do based off that, but it's at least giving you a better idea of, like, how bad is their suicidal ideation. Um, and, and actually has been tested to, and used in outside of um, hospital care settings. So reportedly um, police or other, or other agencies that are not involved directly with mental health can actually utilize this screen. So what do I do with a positive screen? And I think the most important thing is that um, you need to use an evidence-based tool or, well, that's what they say, but you need to do an assessment. You can't just rely fully on the screen. Um, and because you're not in the Joint Commission, you don't actually have to use an evidence-based tool. Um, but you, the assessment needs to ask directly about ideation, plan, intent, um, suicidal risk behavior, and protective factors. And so these are just the safety, um, since we're not going to go into them that much, but just to show you what it looks like. And then the other ones, the skill for suicidal ideation, um, which the, the worst one is the one that's developed for 12 and, and up, and then the Beck suicide um, screeners actually, and these take a lot of time, but like I said, you just need to ask about it and you're going to get a better idea of what's happening. So I'm putting this directly up there again, because you need to ask about suicidal ideation, ask about their plan, ask about self-harm, ask about risk factors, and ask about protective factors. And that's going to give you a better idea of what do I need to do with this. And this is, I'm showing you this, this is from the adult data, but 
it's giving you a representation of actually what is happening in the community. So you can actually realize like, okay, not everyone who has thoughts actually are, are making plans or actually doing that. And it's giving you an infograph of like what it looks like and actually really what people, what percent really need to come to the ER because they're actually something bad's about to happen. So now that you've done your suicidal thing, what do you need to do? And I think you need to know when to refer. And I, I don't have what that answer for you because your comfort level is going to vary all, all over the place with that. But you need to know your local resources. So um, if, you, if your kids have DC Medicaid, one of the great things is you have 24 hour, ac hour access to actually getting them an intake appointment through the DC Access Helpline. Now, Virginia and Maryland don't have that ability, but like Virginia at least has um, court CSBs or core servants, core servants building. I don't know what the B actually means, but um, you can actually send them there and it's 24 hours and they can actually get them an appointment. Um, you can also, like, if you're not sure what to do, you can call a lot of the consulting um, patient access lines for DC MAP, VMAP, or BHIP. Um, BHIP is for Maryland. Um, in case you're wondering what that meant. Um, but these are actually ways where pediatricians can actually call and actually get those services. And then be just be comfortable with treating basic mental health concerns. So it's important to know why you shouldn't refer all the way be, for the ER all the time, because this is what the ER looks like. It's exciting. Um, but like you're getting stared at by these lovely people um, at 24 seven and the doors have to remain open and you get stripped down to like not in your clothing. It kind of feels like jail. You're stuck there for a long time. These are the lockers. Your lockers have to be locked up so you don't get to have any of your possessions. And you're stuck there for eight or eight hours. This is actually, even the parents can't have things. So they have other siblings that they need to deal with. They actually can't have anything. So this can act, coming to the ER can actually be very traumatizing. Um, so it's important that you guys address this and even take care of this because the highest risk of actually suicide attempt or death is in the, la the next 30 days after discharge from the ED or an inpatient unit. So even if you're coming to the ED, you're like, oh, they didn't get admitted. Inpatient unit is probably not going to change the trajectory too much. 70% um, of patients who leave the ED after a suicide attempt don't make their first outpatient appointment. But they probably are going to maybe be seeing you or at least you have a better connection with them. So you need it's important that you actually help help them out and go and actually look into this. And about 37% of individuals with, without a mental health or chemical dependency di di diagnosis who died by suicide make an e a visit to the ED within the last year. So we, that's an even higher coming to the outpatient appointment, I mean, coming to the outpatient things. So you need to address that because if we don't address it, you're just going to miss it. And you still have to address it too, even if you do catch it, because the average wait time to see someone like me is about three to nine months, depending on where you're going to. So unfortunately, there's not enough of everybody, so you have to be comfortable with dealing with this. So if you're worried or, or scared about doing this, the biggest thing is just to be yourself, remain calm, ask directly about it, focus on your concern, listen, don't judge. Remove them from the from um, ways to actually help um, that, that help them get to access to self-harm abilities and then get help when you need to. And here are my resources and we'll follow up with questions. Are there any questions online? <laughs> no. I guess I answered all your questions. <laughs> well, thank you so no. much. Me yeah, Megan, thanks yeah. for, yeah, no, it's okay. I wanna thank Dr. Schott for a great uh, overview. Um, this is not a one and done situation. I think over the last couple of years, there's been certainly increasing awareness of mental health concerns and suicide risks among uh, the children and the teens that we see in our practice settings. Um, it is clear that the, that the number of kids and families needing services are far in excess of available resources, which creates a lot of uh, stress and tension for us on the front lines as practitioners. Uh, that said, um, our pediatric health network um, has been committed to working with our uh, pediatricians, our practices, our care teams, um, the, the local access programs in DC, Maryland, and Virginia uh, to really acknowledge, identify, and elevate um, how we approach 
uh, behavioral health and mental health concerns. Um, and so we've, um, uh, we are building out teams. We are working with uh, practices and coaching them. We are um, hosting learning sessions so practices can learn from each other. Uh, and many of these are spearheaded by our pediatric health network team uh, led by Dr. Lee Beers, who's done a lot of uh, work in this space with a great team from children's and around the country. So um, we can't fix this in 25 minutes, but it is something that is all about continued awareness and continued learning and continued building of resources. There was one question that came up late on the chat, Dr. Schott, if you're open for that. Um, the question is, when are you going to have more outpatient resources in psych? So the question is for outpatient resources in psych. Um, and the comment was emphasis on the responsibility and psych's res shared responsibility. Well, you actually need to improve the ability for psychiatrists and mental health actually to stay here. Um, that's a, We have a huge access problem. Um, people are not going into child psychiatry. They're going to psychiatry. And that's actually changed in the last three years. So... Um, and then we also have to make sure that like wanting to stay in this area and because of the um, because of the high cost of living, a lot of psychiatrists or mental health professionals are actually leaving to where areas where it's actually not as high a cost of living. And you actually make it make a higher salary um, and, and doing private care, private practice rather than um, not private practice. And so we have to somehow somehow incentivize people going into child mental health. And we're, we're doing that in a lot of advocacy fronts to actually change that, but that's a, a long battle that's not gonna be changed overnight. And um, and so it's unfortunate. So I can't actually say how we're gonna improve, change it, improve it and get it better because we just don't have the resources that are there. Mike on here, here we go, thank you. Uh, the one other, um, one of several areas we are looking at is um, how pediatric practices can uh, identify um, resources for behavioral health support, um, as well as opportunities to begin to figure out in the right practice setting how to bring some of those behavioral health resources right into the pediatric practices um, so that um, uh, as concerns get identified, there are more immediate resources with uh, which uh, help support the pediatricians, but also provides more comfortable and immediate access to families. Uh, 